Welcome to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us today. We believe today's message is going to strengthen and encourage you. So get your Bibles ready as Pastor Jeremy File is teaching today's message. I'm here to tell you something that from the get-go of the church age, here is the message that's been ringing in the ears of all those that are following God and walking with Him. Jesus is coming. If you don't write anything else down tonight, you might as well write that down. The King is coming. Yeah, I can hear the sound of angels. (laughs) I'm not going to sing. I'm just telling you, He's coming. Look at your neighbor and say, He's coming. Now, don't you dare... Get too familiar with this message. You know the sin of familiarity has to do with people around you and, and spiritual leadership God's called you to. But in your marriage, you can have that sin of familiarity. God's called that person to be your spouse, your covenant partner. If you get too familiar, you let that sin creep in on you, you won't get what God designed for you out of that. Well, you could hear this. Jesus is coming. And you could say, oh, yeah, I've, I've heard that. Well, that's the attitude of mockers. As the Bible says, you know, in the last time, there will be mockers. And they'll say, where's the promise of his return? In other words, yeah, we've heard that, but he ain't come yet. I know, but we're closer than we've ever been. You see, every series I've ever preached about this, I've been stirred up about the fact the king is coming, and I've preached it. Sometimes the people shouting, sometimes the people staring at me like a cow at a new gate, but either way, the king is coming. And now I advance, and here's another series on end times, and I'm going to tell you, we are closer now than we've ever been, so this isn't the time to be like, oh yeah, I done heard that. No, it's the time to be excited. And I want to say this, you're going to live with a different edge to your Christianity if you really believe the king is coming than you would without this belief. Those that don't believe he's coming, they don't live with this edge, with this purity the Bible talks about. Those that have this blessed hope ahead of them purify themselves. Why? Because there's some things you don't want to be caught up in if you really believe the king is coming tonight. Think of how much wasted time we spend on things that we wouldn't want the king to find us even spending time on. Wow, he is coming. Yeah. And in Acts chapter 1, we read several verses on Sunday. And I want you to go directly to verse 6, and then we're going to pick up where we left off. I just want you to know that he is coming. The disciples lived with this message. He's coming. Praise God. When they tried to persecute him and stone him and and threatened to behead Christians and apostles there in the book of Acts. This is what they had on their mind. He's coming. And they lived with this edge. And yeah, it rocked the normal society of the day. Just like it will today. If you live with this, the king is coming. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Because you know purity is going to be a big thing. And then you're going to hear a whole sect of Christians say, Oh, you're into legalism. No, I don't care a thing in the world about legalism. Legalism will kill. That's just the word only, not catching the spirit of the word. But you come to this church, this isn't about legalism. This is about being focused on the fact he's coming. And how do I want to find him? Excuse me, how do I want him to find me when I see him? Because when you see him, you're going to hope to God that you're living right. Well, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Jesus is with his disciples. And this is right before he's raptured up. We're going to talk about that tonight. But go to Acts 1, 6 and say, thank God for the word. word. Well, I'm stirred up about this tonight. I hope you are. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And we were talking about this when we left off Sunday. I'm not going to re-preach all this. I'm just going to hitch my wagon where I left off. Are you okay with that? So this is the disciples asking the question, are we there yet? Because they had believed scriptures more than likely like the one in Daniel 7. Let's see if it's the right one tonight. Verse 27. You know, that was actually a good test for you. Because can you trust what I'm putting up here as the word? Well, not if you don't go check it in the Bible. Amen. Daniel 7, 27. It doesn't make it Bible just because it's on the screen. It makes it Bible when it's in your Bible. You got that? 
I believe the disciples knew about this because they asked Jesus specifically, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Why would they say kingdom? Because of a scripture like this in Daniel 7, 27, and it's really there, I checked. Here's what it says. Then the kingdom, the what? Oh, okay. And dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. The saints of the most high God. I added God, but that's who he's talking about here. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. See, I believe the disciples were like, all right, all these unbelievers are about to get what's coming their way. You're establishing the kingdom now. Praise God. They didn't know about something called the church age, which you and I are alive in right now. (laughs) We're a part of this. You know, the book of Acts is still being written, don't you? And Acts is my foundation scripture in this series. I'll just let you know the book of Acts is still being written and you're a part of it. At least you're supposed to be. Uh Uh-huh. So because they had this scripture, and by the way, this scripture is true. It will happen. But we're not there yet. (laughs) You you, you catch my drift there. (laughs) They thought we're there. But we're not there yet. We're in something called the church age, which was a mystery hidden in Christ. The, The Old Testament prophets, they could not see it for whatever reason. And if that bugs you, you can settle it with the Lord if you make it to heaven. (laughs) <laughs> but we're not there yet, though this is true. I believe this was on the, the disciples' mind, this and some other scriptures, but I think you get the point. And part of it was Daniel 9 that we read when we ended on Sunday that shows us the abomination of desolation that will happen in the temple, in Jerusalem, in the middle of the tribulation period. And I just want you to know, we also read about the remaining seven-year period of time that was prophesied, and it says, quote, is determined for Israel and Jerusalem. That's in Daniel 9 and verse 24, right? So jot that down. And actually, just go to Daniel, because I'm going to read a couple of verses there and kill this spider that's on the pulpit. I kill things like that. There's not too many good spiders in this world, except dead ones. So let me say this. The disciples remind me of modern day Christians because they were probably thinking of a verse like this, but not thinking of some other verses. You see what I'm talking about? So they were a little bit half cocked when they were like, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? And we know because we read through it on Sunday, Jesus said, not, not right now. You need to go be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm about to build my church on you guys. (laughs) They don't even know it the moment in right there with Jesus. They don't even know right then. They certainly weren't expecting to see a rapture happen right in front of them. They may have been like a lot of modern day Christians and say, a rapture, that's weird. I mean, I doubt it, but they could have been, but they saw it. They saw him go right up. Praise God. We'll talk more about that in a minute. You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. Look at Daniel 9. In verse 25, I want to point something out here. I don't want you to get lost in the words. A lot of Christians get lost in all the wordiness. But don't do that. Daniel 9, 25, since we're there in Daniel, let me read a couple of these verses and point something out that you need to know that will help you understand end times. This is what I was talking to Pastor Chris about earlier a little bit. It says, know therefore and understand that the, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, you may not be like me, but I'm a visual person, so I've got to see this. So I, was on, I had a notepad in front of me when I was studying, and I just wrote seven plus 62. Boy, I was glad to see that. I've been helping my kids with math, several different ones, and even getting caught in a little bit of algebra last night. And I was like, boy, I sure like this one easy. I can figure this out. 
Seven plus 62 equals 69. I wrote that on my piece of paper. 69 weeks of years. That 69 periods of seven years prophesied specifically for Israel and Jerusalem. And here's what you got to see. It'll be 69 weeks and Messiah the Prince will show up. The street will be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now look at verse 26, the first part of it. Now, I cut off all the wordiness at the end. It's good, you need to read it, but I'm trying to emphasize something that I want to get over to you tonight. It says, and after the 62 weeks, and this is where people get confused. Remember, the seven was before the 62. So wording it this way makes people think, well, after the 62 weeks. No, it's after the 69 weeks. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but I have talked to Jewish rabbis about this verse. And I've gotten the same response from everyone that I know that's a, a hardcore Jew. When I was in uh, Christians United for Israel, I was able to meet some of these guys. One, I'm a leading rabbi, even a very smart guy. He was John Hagee's friend. And I was able to talk to him. Mark was with me one time when I talked to him, but I talked to him another time. And I asked him about this. And he said, I like to come across a Christian that knows his Old Testament. I said, oh, yeah, I love to study the Old Testament. I'm a new, I, I understand I'm a new covenant guy. I serve Jesus, and that man doesn't. I understand this. But I asked him. I said, what does it mean in Daniel chapter 9, where it says after 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off? He said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Now, what you think about this for a minute. I'm not hating on anyone. I'm just telling you, this is something to think about. That Daniel would prophesy, and this would be so clear, that 69 weeks of this prophecy would come to pass. Jesus would be here, but then the Messiah will be cut off. Cut off from who? Cut off from the Jewish people. Cut off, but not for himself. Can I tell you who he was cut off for? You and me so that we would have an opportunity to make it in the kingdom. And you say, I don't know if I believe this. Oh, look, I wrote this in my actual notes here. So seven plus 62 is 69 weeks. All you have to do is be able to add that to understand this and not get all bondaged up with all the words. I don't know what this means. That's difficult. It's really not difficult. But here's what I want you to catch. There's a definite mark in time after 69 weeks. However, Verse 24, if you have your Bible open there, I don't have it on the screen, but we read it Sunday. Verse 24, just two verses before this says, 70 weeks are determined. Determined where? In heaven. For Israel. So, you don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed to understand that there's one week, that seven years, are left on Daniel's prophecy. And this will help you. You need to know this. Though it may sound boring to you on a Wednesday night, this isn't at all boring because you are going to hear so many convoluted, confused, some of them well-meaning believers, some I'm not so sure they're well-meaning, try to convince you, well, that rapture stuff, especially pre-tribulation rapture, is not true. People are going to tell you that in your life. Here's what you can always say. What about Daniel's 70th week? And I will already pre-tell you what they're going to say. One answer, there's like two or three answers that you always get. One is this, I don't know. I never looked at it. Two, they'll tell you, I don't know. I've heard about it, but I don't know. Three, they'll say this, I don't know. <laughs> That's what they're going to say. Because you cannot explain uh, this 70th week without understanding that that last seven-year period is designed, and I'm just going to cut to the chase, to bring Israel to Jesus, the Messiah. Because as it sits right now, the majority of the Jewish people do not believe Jesus is the Messiah. They don't believe that. And can I tell you from my experience of sitting down even with Jewish people in our city, they don't know what Christians believe. They think we're a bit radical. They think we're just in a, a religion that was spurred and brought out of Judaism. And they're right about that part. 
But that's about all they understand about us. And here's what they think. I'm just telling you this. They think you don't know your Bible. And the truth is most Christians don't. And that's why you hear someone half-cocked talking about, well, in times, boy, we don't know. It's all going to pan out. Most Christians have this mindset nowadays. I'm not even going to worry about it. It's all going to work out. Well, that's no way to live. God wrote this because it's supposed to be something we look forward to and comforts us when we lose believers around us. Because I want to tell you, on this side of, the, of heaven, there's not much more pain I've ever experienced or understand or know about and seen people in than when they lose someone close to them. Yeah? And we're supposed to be comforted because we know. I don't sorrow as those with no hope because there's a resurrection day coming where the dead in Christ will rise first. And praise God in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Woo! There will be those of us that are changed. And we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Yes, I'm blending 1 Corinthians 15 with 1 Thessalonians 4. But that's the truth of the matter. That's what's going to happen. But you've got to understand something. There's another week left. So I want you to ask yourself this, not out loud, but I want you to think about this. And I think we should all ask ourselves this. Where's the other week? The Messiah was cut off. When's the other week happening? I'll just tell you, in the future from where we are this moment. Yeah. You see, the gospel was first preached to the Jews. Jesus said himself, I came to my own, but my own received me not. He came to save the Jewish people. Yes. Just like was prophesied. But see, they prophesied and they were prophesying about him coming back a second time and didn't realize he was going to come a first time. They totally missed it. But it's because God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Because he loved the whole world. The whole world. The whole world. That's you and me, thank God. Glory to God. So he made a way for you and I, because I don't know everybody in here. I don't know your ancestry, but I can tell you, there's not too many natural Jews in this building right now. But there's a few spiritual ones that have been grafted in. You might as well say I'm one of them. Praise God. So the gospel was first preached to the Jews. And did you know this? All the apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. So instead of getting a bad attitude about the Jews, see, that's the wrong spirit. God used the Jewish people to birth the Savior. Both of his parents were Jews. You're just going to have to deal with this. See, people have... Well, you, I had a guy tell me this. You, you think Jesus was white? I said, I certainly don't. He was a Jew. He got a nice tan. More than likely. Probably tan's easy. He doesn't like that. You ever seen some Jewish people? Man, I've seen some. They tan easy. But I thank God he loves all of us. Red, yellow, black, and white. We're precious in his sight. Who knew that when I sang that in little kids' class, I was getting part of God put on the inside of me. Thank God. But I want you to catch this because where was the shift from the Jews to the Gentiles? You can actually find it in the book of Acts. I encourage you to read all of chapter 13. You'll see specifically what I'm saying. But for time's sake, I just want to fast forward in Acts 13 to verse 46 and show you this. Say, thank God for the word. Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold. The Holy Ghost gets on you, you grow bold. Accelerate Church has opened its doors to a second location located at 1300 East Central Avenue in Amarillo. The Word of God is thundering forth every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. from seasoned ministers here at Accelerate. If you live in the area, we invite you to join us for power-packed services each week and bring the entire family. We have something for the little ones too. God is building strong families and we would love for your family to join us. The Holy Spirit waxes bold when you yield to him. Now, if I sit there like a lump on the log and said, I ain't going to preach, I ain't going to do like some Christians do. And nothing, you never have to worry about it. He could find you a limp wrist, lukewarm. That'd be all right if you want to live that life. Of course, that ends in vomit. But hey, if that's what you want, then go for it. Lukewarm. You understand most, most Christians in America are very lukewarm at best. All right, enough about that. They grew bold. 
They said it was necessary that the word of God should have been spoken to you first. Now, if you'll read, like I said, Acts 13, you'll find that the you here was the Jewish people. So he said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject the word and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. It's a big statement because Paul was a Jew of Jews at one time. You may not know this, but Jews that, that ticked on the level that Paul did, that understood the law, he could at any time stand there and quote to you any part of Genesis through Deuteronomy. At any given moment, drop of a hat, he could do it. So he was, here's what happens when you know that much of the Bible. Trust me, I know my dad made me take Bible memory. I couldn't say all those for sure, but boy, I was sure pompous when I showed up in Amarillo and went to a church where young people were radical about praising God. I thought, I cannot quote these people in Scripture. Are you living it? No, you won't even worship. See what I'm talking about? So Paul was like that, and he said, by the way, that life I count, all that is dung. <laughs> Woo, that's what it equates to. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like smelling dung. I don't like talking about dung. But that's what all that is, all that headiness that gets, gets you all confused. Now, I'm not saying no study of the Bible. I'm just saying... You're going to have to get this. This is twice I've said this is for somebody. You got to get the spirit of the word in you. Where it goes from logos to rhema. Where it's alive and popping on the inside of you. Is anybody with me tonight? All right. I want you to catch this. Paul was telling us something very interesting. We got to preach the word to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Yeah. But see, something changed. I don't have this in the notes. But. I want to read this to you. If you, you got a second. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 says, this is New Testament now. See, I want you to catch this. This is where we are now. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3.28. I read that scripture one time to a Jewish man here in Amarillo. And he said, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait. I didn't, I, I, I'm confused. What does that mean you think about Jews like myself? Now, thankfully, had a guy with me that day that popped up before I had to because I offend people all the time and I don't even mean to, but I thought, oh, no, I know this is going to be offensive what I'm about to say. And before I could get it out, the other guy says, well, we believe you're going to hell. Unless you receive Jesus as your Savior. Do you understand what you're a part of in Christianity? Do you understand throughout the ages it's been deemed and looked at as radical and crazy? It's very exclusive. And in an inclusive America, it makes you stand out. You see, there is still only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. He is the way, not a way. He is the truth, not a truth. He is the life. There's no other life outside of him. It's that simple. Oh, see people, oh, I serve Jesus. Yeah, all right you do. You do life your own way, and you think that you're his? Well, I, I pick and choose what I want. No, just follow the word. Now, people say, well, you don't know everything that's in there. True. No one does. But you're responsible for what you do know. And that's what hit me in 2006. I said, how can I sit here and think I'm so pompous? Oh, I cannot quote these people in Scripture. They don't even know. I'm wasting my life, though, because I'm not doing anything. And God put all that on the inside of me. Twelve years of Christian school, and I ain't using any of it. Been in church my whole life. I said, that's it. I'm done with fake Christianity. I'm done with just sitting in church, not even getting anything out of it, leaving and going and living and doing what I want. I'm done living that way. I'm done living the lifestyle where I could quote my pastor, but I couldn't quote the Bible. I'm done living that way. You see, I had fallen to that point. At one point, I could quote the Bible, but I got out of the Bible and just started only following my pastor. Next thing I know, pastor said this, pastor said this, pastor said this. What does the Bible say? 
I don't know. You're in deep doing when that's how you live. I don't like it when you talk like that. Well, we're here, and we don't have time to sit here and try to coddle everything. You understand that? There comes a time where the house is on fire. It's not the time to adjust all the pictures on your, your frame there. All that, that, all that picture's coming out of the frame. Hang on. The house is on fire. You're about to die. Well, let me fix this first. That's how Christians are living. This ain't the time to sit here and try to figure out, am I going to say everything right? What about just a burning love for the Lord that causes you to not be able to even go pick a pair at the store without witnessing to somebody? Whew. Yeah, Barna says, you know, 2% of Christians witness. Two. That means 98% of Christians don't ever witness. Never witness to anybody. Just all it is is sowing a seed of the word. It doesn't mean you get somebody to pray with you. The goal is not to get someone to pray with you. Americans have learned, generally speaking, I'll pray with you to get you off of me if they'll listen to you that long. You talk to somebody about the condition of their soul, it's going to shake them. You don't pray, yeah, because they're shaking a little bit. Because most people don't care enough about others to look beyond the skin. Wow. This message caused great persecution. So much so they kicked them out of their city. The Jews stirred people up. <laughs> Here we are tonight. Again, none of us natural Jews that I know of. But I want you to understand something about God. He's a covenant-minded God. I want you to say covenant-minded with me. One, two, three. One, two, three. Let's do it again. One, two, three. He's a covenant-minded God. He thinks covenant. I know a lot of his people don't, but he thinks covenant. He wants to be in covenant with you. Now, I want, to, I want this to be as clear as I can make it. There's one way to be saved. Jesus. Have I made that clear tonight? That's it. The Lamb of God. The only man that laid his life down as a sacrifice for you and I. And his blood wasn't just blood. He was virgin born. It was the blood of God on that cross. Well, that does conclude today's television broadcast, but if you would like to hear more from Pastor Jeremy File, we invite you to head over to our website at acceleratechurch.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find every sermon that Pastor Jeremy has preached for your convenience. If you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We are located at 4400 South Crockett here in Amarillo, and our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. If you're not from Amarillo, we would still love to hear from you. You can email us at info at accelerate.church.cc or give us a call. We want to know how can we pray for you? Where are you watching and tuning in from? We are so glad that you tuned in with us today.